الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والله غني وأنتم الفقراء سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his glorious book defines himself as rich and defines all of us as poor. Now, when we say that we're poor or that we're in a state of poverty, this actually has many different meanings. One meaning, according to our scholars, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses everything. And in essence, we possess nothing. For example... All the universe that's around us, all of this is actually the ownership of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every single thing that we've been given, whether it be a limited amount of wealth, whether it be a limited amount of power, whether it be a limited ability to make decisions, all of that is extremely limited. And it's given by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's also taken away with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And although it's given... By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a very limited amount, actually the limitation of that not only exists in this life, but when we're raised on the day of judgment, we'll be given none of that. Meaning, for example, in this life I have the option. Right now it's 8.50 at night. I have I have the option. I can come here. I can go out to some other place. Or I can pick some third place where perhaps haram is occurring. So I have the choice in life. I can be at point A, I can be at point C, I can be at point Z. There are so many options available to me, and then I choose what I'd like to do. So in essence, we've been given this small amount of ability to choose, but that exists in this life, and it's very limited. We only have five, six, seven options at any given time, and even those options are limited. For example, if I look up into the sky, and I say I'd like to fly through the sky, I can't do that. I can jump as high as I want, I'm going to fall back down to the ground. My options are limited. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created just a limited ability within me. Now a bird can just take off and fly. Allah gave the bird that ability. But for me, I'm extremely limited in my ability. And although that, even after that limitation, even with that minute amount of ability, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove even that much. So that I won't even have a choice. None of us will have a choice on the day of judgment. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deems us to be resurrected, every single one of us will be resurrected. We have no choice. We cannot say, I want to go back in my grave. I'm not coming right now. Give me 10 extra minutes. I'm preparing myself. There's no option at that point. Every single person will be raised and they'll be raised before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and each and, individ- each and every individual stage will have to be attended irrespective of whether we want to be there or not. This is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. He gave us a limited amount of power in this life, a limited amount of wealth in this life, a limited amount of of ability in this life in order to test us. So that on that day when we have no more power, when we have no more wealth, when we have no more ability, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can then deem where we should be. So in essence, we don't have a choice on that day. But we make choices on this day so that we will end up with a certain result on that day. So we're actually choosing now our fate in the hereafter. So that's one way by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghani. He's all, he, he, he owns every single thing. He's wealthy, he's rich, and we are poor. Okay, now another way, and actually you can go on discussing this, uh, for hours, but there, another way in which this, this discussion arises is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is independent and we are dependent. That's the other another way to look at it. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's abilities are completely independent of anything else. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is samir. 
Samir in the Arabic language means the one who hears. But it's a very weird and unique form. Sama, actually Sama in the Arabic language, Sin, Mim, Ain. This imp- implies the ability to hear something. But when you say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Samir, what that means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears from whatever he deemed himself to hear, and he will hear all the way until he deems himself to hear. Meaning his hearing encompasses every single thing. Now, if I say to you that I hear something, then my hearing is dependent. What do I mean? Well, number one, it's dependent on me. I have to be present, I have to be alive to hear something that's obvious, right? But number two, it's dependent on you. You have to make a sound before I can say I hear something. Now, if I stand up and I say, it's just, imagine it's pitch silent. And I stand up and I say, I hear something. Everybody will say, what do you hear? Right? In order for me to hear something, there has to be some noise that's present to be heard. So my hearing is dependent. It's dependent on the fact that some other noise is present. So in Arabic, they say that I'm Samir. I'm the one who hears. I'm the listener. I'm listening to another sound. But actually, the term that's used for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is as-samir. As-samir means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears even if there's no noise. His hearing is independent of any noise. His, he is always hearing. It's a very unique way of expressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's infinite power, infinite ability. So again, this is just another way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is independent. He's ghani. وَأَنْتُمُ الْفُقَرَىٰ And we are fuqara. Now this term fuqara actually is plural. And it's single, single form, it's the singular of it is faqir. Now this term faqir is actually what I want to touch upon. Because if you read through books of the mutasawwifin, the people who were, who emphasized their spiritual development, you'll see this term a lot, the term faqir. Either in Arabic they'll say, uh, al faqir. Somebody's talking about something that he did. Somebody, let's just say there's some famous sheikh. He's writing something about his history. He's writing up something about what happened to him during his life. And he'll say, هذا الفقير. This faqir. Okay? And you'll find this also in uh, Urdu writings, in Turkish writings, in Persian writings, in English writings. The same term that the people of spiritual understanding, they referred to themselves as faqir. Okay? As dependent. Now the reason why they refer to themselves as faqir is because they recognize, they come to the state of recognition that every single thing that they achieved was actually dependent. Dependent on the independent. Meaning dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sometimes we sit down and we think, okay, I I came to the masjid today. I prayed the fajr prayer. I woke up for fajr prayer. I went to jumu'ah today. I came for Isha prayer in the masjid. I gave away $50 in sadaqah, right? So we begin to attribute these deeds to ourselves. I did, I did, I did. Actually, when you get to a certain level in your understanding, then that whole I concept disappears. It's no longer I. It actually has nothing to do with I. It's not that I came for Fajr prayer. It's that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala woke me and gave me the tawfiq to arrive for fajr prayer. See, now it's the same thing is occurring. There's a person, his name is Zaid. Zaid comes to the masjid for fajr prayer. One way to under- express that is, I came for fajr prayer. Another way to express that is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala woke me for fajr prayer, gave me the tawfiq to come for fajr prayer. Subhanallah allowed me to join the fajr prayer. So here now everything gets attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing that actually the ability to come to Fajr prayer is dependent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission, his tawfiq, his will. So that is why people who have achieved spiritual status, they often call themselves faqir. Because they recognize that actually any single thing that they may have outwardly achieved that people may outwardly attribute to them, actually has nothing to do with them. But only has to do with the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted them to achieve that state. Or permitted them to gain the ability to be able to act upon those particular things. So actually it's a way of seeing the entire world through the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And that's actually the goal of every single mu'min. To begin to recognize that actually everything comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we come from Allah and that all of our actions come from Allah and that in the end we return to Allah. And in the, and actually in the very end it will only be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will deem our final fate. So that's another reason why these people refer to themselves as faqir. Okay, that's three under, uh, three interpretations of the word faqir or fuqara. Okay, the fourth interpretation actually has a very general um, application amongst all of us. And it took me many years to understand this. So I'm sharing this with you after many, many years of experience and then finally understanding what this really meant. Okay, the fourth reason or the fourth way of interpreting, the four of many actually, way of interpreting this word faqir is that often when a person becomes very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they make themselves available to the community as a poor person to be taken in by whoever within the community takes them in. You have to actually listen a little bit to understand this. When somebody becomes spiritually elevated, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the tawfiq, to become spiritually elevated and actually whether even even in knowledge and knowledge is part of spiritual development so put that whole thing together whether they be ulama or whether they be mashayikh because there's no alim except that he develops his, his connection with Allah and there's no shaykh except that he uses knowledge to act upon his connection with Allah okay so in essence this is one group of people that we're discussing now what happens is when these people reach that stage of alam or when that re- that reach that stage of qurb to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they then remove their connections with people. And they make themselves dependent upon anybody within the community that's willing to adopt them. Alright? You understand what I'm saying? I'll give you two examples. One example from the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received his initial message, right, through the angel Jibreel alayhi salam, when he was crowned with his prophethood, when he was deemed to be the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then many of his past relationships, they evaporated. Although he had an uncle, that relationship somewhat separated. Of course, the uncle remained the uncle. But that closeness and that tie that existed did not remain the same. Instead, what the Prophet ﷺ did was he made himself available to those people who took him in. Now the greatest among those who took him in was actually a family, a family of people, led by one individual, but actually represented by an entire family. And that was Abu Bakr an and all of his family. Now what happened was Abu Bakr radiallahu an was the first to come and give the Prophet ﷺ his acceptance of Islam. Now when he gave his acceptance of Islam, he not only became the first adult male to do so, but he also took the Prophet wasallam's weight, his message, and himself, the man, the, the man himself, he took the Prophet wasallam himself and brought him into the circle of the family of Abu Bakr radiallahu an. How so? Well, first of all, Immediately after Abu Bakr radiallahu an converted or took the shahada, he then went through the entire community and brought as many people as he could into that same circle. Now look, actually whose responsibility was it? Was it Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu an's responsibility to bring people? No. It was actually the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa responsibility and at that point the Prophet sallallahu had not even been told to openly go and spread the message. At this point was the very initial stages of the da'wah the Prophet ﷺ was actually only working within his close circle. But through the bringing of Abu Bakr radiallahu then Abu Bakr radiallahu an brought some major players from the society at that time. SubhanAllah, many of those people became among the Ashara Mubashara, the ten people who were guaranteed Jannah. The, the ten Sahaba who were guaranteed Jannah by the tongue of the Prophet ﷺ. So, number one, Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu an took the responsibility of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam placed some of it on his own shoulder and began to to work as hard as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was working. That was the first thing. Second thing is that he made himself like 
he made his whole family actually like the family of the Prophet alayhi salam. Meaning he took the Prophet, he adopted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So much so, with so much love, with so much fervor, that Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha says that there was not a single day that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, except that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam visited our home two times in one day. Think about it. Now you think about some close friend that you have, some relationship that you forged. We have two types of relationship in life. Either Allah forged the relationship and then we have a responsibility of protecting it. For example, mother, father, brother, sister, aunt, uncle. Allah created that relationship. We protect and maintain that relationship. Or we forge relationships and we create relationships, right? So the relationship that exists between us in this room, this is a relationship that was created. We're not related. We have we have linked ourselves for a purpose. In the same way, the, the uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu an created and forged such a deep relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that not once a day, twice a day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to the house of Abu Bakr radiallahu an to visit the entire family. Subhanallah. Now you think about your closest friend, you think about your mother. How many of us visit our mothers twice a day? Okay, how many of us visit our fathers twice a day? And if your children don't live with you, how much how many how many times do you see your children? Not twice a day. Yet Abu Bakr and his whole family created such a love between themselves and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were so adoptive of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that actually the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would visit so frequently that every single day he came twice. And Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha says, I can't even remember a day. I cannot even remember a day except that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came two times in a day. SubhanAllah, that frequently, that regularly, that continuously, you can see how deep and passionate that love must have been. So what the family of Abu Bakr radiallahu an did was that they adopted this faqir. Actually, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had become a faqir. He had become someone who had orphaned himself in the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then what happens is whoever takes that responsibility on their shoulders those people then become adopted into that crowd of people. That's actually how it works. Now, that then perpetuated all the way until the time of the hijrah, when the Prophet ﷺ was ready to make his journey from Mecca to Medina. Now, remember that that actually is the key journey in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Actually, the Prophet ﷺ took two journeys. Both of those journeys are the defining journeys of the Prophet ﷺ. So we go back in our lives and we say, oh, I took three trips, I took four trips, I took two trips in my life that were really defining to me. Actually, the Prophet ﷺ took two major trips that really defined this deen. One trip he took from the ground to the heavens, which is called the Mi'raj. One trip he took from Mecca to Medina, which is called the Hijra. These are the two defining journeys in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. On both journeys, he was accompanied by a companion. On the journey from the ground to the heavens, the Mi'raj, the Prophet ﷺ was accompanied by the angel Jibreel ﷺ. And when it came to the journey on the ground from Mecca to Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected Abu Bakr radiallahu an to be his companion in that particular journey. Why? Because Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu an had adopted the Prophet ﷺ. Now, it was not only Abu Bakr radiallahu an that was given that blessing. It was actually the entire family. In fact, the day of the hijrah, or at the time when the Prophet ﷺ had been commanded to make the hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ came into the house of Abu Bakr at a time when he ne- regularly did not come. All right. Now, not o- that tells you that not only did the Prophet ﷺ come twice a day, he came regularly at, spe- at specified times twice a day. It was into his schedule. It was built in. It was something that he did daily. Now, on one particular day, the Prophet ﷺ came at a time when he usually didn't come. So Hazrat Abu Bakr knew that something special was going on. Now when, Hazrat, when the Prophet ﷺ came at that time, and this is all narrated in the book of Imam Bukhari, Rahmatullah when, Hazrat, when the Prophet ﷺ came to the house of Abu Bakr at, radiallahu an, at that time, then the Prophet ﷺ wanted privacy. So he, Abu Bakr radiallahu an had already picked out that something unique is happening. Something different is occurring this day. Because the Prophet ﷺ was so frequent at another time and now has come at this new time. 
He had already cleared out the house except the family. He had asked the servants to leave, etc. Only the family was present. When the Prophet ﷺ asked for privacy when he arrived, Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu anh said, Ya Rasulullah, this is your family. He, he, he expressed to the Prophet ﷺ that actually this is your family. This is your privacy. We are you and you are us. So then the Prophet ﷺ explained that I have been commanded to make the hijrah. This is to be kept extremely private. And actually, on the hijrah, not only did Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu anh accompany the Prophet ﷺ, but the whole family actually became involved. One of the servants of, the, of Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu anh prepared the animals. One of the daughters of Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu anh was given a different responsibility. Each of the family members was given the responsibility of taking care of that journey. Now, obviously, the family of the Prophet sent them helped as well. But look at the special blessing when it came to this huge trip that was to occur, this huge journey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected the whole family of Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu anh to assist in that journey. So this is just to, goes to show you how these people adopted that faqir, meaning the Prophet alayhi salam. So that was, I said I'd give you two examples. Actually, that's one example. And believe it or not, despite studying hadith, despite reading these hadith, despite reading this historical narration, that never really set in my mind. You know, I read about it and never thought about it in this way. Until one day, when I was sitting in Hajj, and I was sitting with Shaykh Zulfiqar in the Hajj, and somebody came and asked Shaykh Zulfiqar to come and give a talk in their tent. And this was a person who, show, had, who showed tremendous love, uh, tremendous fervor, was very devoted, had taken on some of the responsibilities that Shaykh Zulfiqar had already had upon his shoulder and had assisted him in those responsibilities. So he came and asked. And I saw Shaykh Zulfiqar's eyes were bloodshot at that time. He was very tired. He was very fatigued. And he you know, looked like he needed rest. And then that person came and said, will you come to our tent in order to give a talk. Now, when he said that, I saw Shaykh Zulfiqar's face look up and he said that we are fuqara. We have no place else to go. So we go wherever we are accepted. Meaning whoever adopts us, that's the place we're going to go. So from that, then that hit me. You know, so many years later, that actually that's what these, these people mean when they say that they're faqir, that they're fuqara, meaning they've given themselves up completely. And they, whoever adopts them, that's the direction they're going to go in. And I can tell you, then and only then, after so many years of all this relationship and trying to strive in this path, then and only then it hit me. And so then I started thinking, you know, this is actually the way by which you gain the company, the closeness, and the love of those people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has selected to carry his deen. And that's actually the lesson that I want to point out to each of you. Is that one of the blessings, one of the most valuable things that you can obtain in your life. Look, there's many things that we we obtain. We obtain degrees, we obtain friends, friendships, we obtain connections, we get a house, we get a car. And these are the things that we consider valuable within our life. We say, I work towards this and I earn this. I work towards that and I earn that. So we have all these things that we place value upon. Right? Now I'll just tell you, just, just sharing something personal from my own life. I'll tell you that there are many, many things that you get the opportunity in life to be able to achieve. You know, you get a degree, you get a job, you get wealth, you get a house, you make friends, you get teachers, etc., all of these things are, are there and they have their place. But if I have to go back in my life and I have to think, like, what is the one of the greatest blessings that I can actually put my hand on and say, wow, that's something that I will always think about. That's something that just I really look back on and say, subhanAllah, what a huge blessing. Actually, it's the fact that based on my sitting with other people and seeing how they took in Sheikh Zulfiqar, I was able to do that for just a very short period of time. For example, you know, just the last time Sheikh Zulfiqar was here, you know, I was, he was very busy. Oh, actually, we were very busy. Obviously, he's busy. We're very, very busy trying to get together, keep the entire program together. Many of you are, have the opportunity to attend a program. So you sit down, you listen to a talk, you benefit. 
but you don't recognize how much sweat and tears goes into getting everything organized that way. You know, people are coming to visit. People want to talk two, three hours. They've got problems. They've got issues, etc. All these people are placing demands on his time. We're trying to organize the entire program. We're trying to get his food together, etc. So it so happened that the last time he was here, we were in the house. Actually, this happened two times. On the first occasion, we were in the house, and he was really hungry. So he said, okay, let's have breakfast. So I just kind of looked at him, recognizing that I hadn't gotten, I hadn't had breakfast ready. I was so busy doing so many other things, and all the other brothers were busy so, doing so many other things. So I just looked at him almost, you know, with fear, and I just said that, you know, I know you want to have breakfast, but we don't have it ready. So he actually, he actually just stood up and he said, well, this is my house, so where's the bowl? You know, and he just got up and he started getting the bowl and the egg and the, and the vegetables together. So on one hand, I felt really embarrassed because I said, look, now, you know, this is such a high guest and he's, you know, he's such a, such a person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put so much weight on him. We should have had his food ready. But at the same time, I, I, those words ring in my mind, you know. This is my house. It's the same thing. This is just a, a matter of the home, right? So I can go and get my own stuff. So he comfortably just went and started getting his bowl together until we finally convinced him that, no, 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 sit down. We'll prepare your breakfast. Then we just prepared it. Right? And the same thing happened on another occasion when he had given a talk and then I lost his glasses or I couldn't find his glasses. He needed his glasses to read something. So when we couldn't find his glasses, then he started looking. Then he said, you know, where are the glasses? And I said, you know, I don't know where the glasses are. I think they were here. Let me call this person. Let me call that person. So he just started getting up and he started singing this knot to himself. You know, uh, this, this, very, this sort of um, praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praise of the Prophet in the Urdu language. So he started singing this very silently to himself and he just started going through all my drawers. You know, he's like walking around the house, opening all the drawers, looking for his glasses and I'm sitting there thinking, what's in those drawers? You know, I hope he doesn't open the wrong drawer. I don't know what he's even opening. But at the same time, in my mind, I'm thinking, subhanAllah, what a huge blessing that he can feel so comfortable here, you know, that he will open the drawers as if it's his own home. Because you don't just go into somebody's house and start opening their drawers, right? Not if you're a person who has manners. And obviously, he's been trained. He's got manners. So, again, that just goes to show you that when you can... See, in our lives, one of the greatest assets that we have is our connection with people who are fuqara. People who have given up everything in their life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who have put their desires, their aspirations, their dreams, their goals aside, and have taken on this responsibility on their, on their shoulders of raising the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now those people are present in every community. Those people are present wherever you are. And one of the greatest assets that you can do is to develop connections with those people. Take those people in. Adopt those people. So you'll see, there are so many ulama. In Chicago, you have so many opportunities, right? And I know that people hear these talks all over the world. So in every community, there's always this opportunity. When you find that opportunity, the goal is that you take those people in so that you develop this very close relationship between yourself and them. And I'll tell you, it provides amazing benefits. I'm just listing you two or three things that in my mind, you know, I only have 10, 15 memories of life. When you Actually, if you sit down and you think about, let me run my life through my mind, you're only going to come up with 10, 20, 30, maybe 50 memories, right? You don't remember the tiny details. You remember the big things. But like when I close my mind, when I close my eyes, and in my mind, I run through, you know, what are some of the impressive memories within my mind those are the memories that are actually ingrained deeply deeply within my mind that these are this is the type of relationship that we had so it's just a huge blessing and i'll tell you there are so many blessings that come out of this there are so many blessings the dua like i don't i'm not even there but the dua that perhaps he makes for me or he makes for people who take on this responsibility or adopt him in this manner right i can't even begin to fathom the advice that he gives me because I'm like his son, right? Or the advice that he gives my wife because she's like his daughter, right? Or the way he treats my kids as if they're his kids, the way he makes the offer them, the way he advises me and tells me things that perhaps even my best friend would not tell me because they would be ashamed of telling me or they would feel that there's some sort of, you know, there's, that there's some sort of um, formality so they can't mention it. But he just openly comes and tells me. In many occasions, he just openly comes out and says, look, you should have done this. Now, he does it in a very gentle way, but that relationship exists. It's like this very close family tie. It's like a father and a son almost. 
In fact, I've heard Sheikh Zulfiqar say that an individual actually has two fathers. I've heard him say this, that they have an individual should consider that in life they have two fathers. One father brings their soul from the sky to the ground in the sense that he is the means of their birth. And the other father takes the soul back from the ground and elevates it to the sky. And that's the father that be either is the scholar that they relate themselves with or the sheikh that they relate themselves with or that person, righteous person who teaches them to constantly elevate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's great name. So actually people have two fathers in that regard. Now obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed a very, very strong responsibility of an individual to respect their blood father and nothing can overtake that. But as a corollary to that, you can see that when someone does so much for you, right, and actually raises you for your purpose, takes you from ignorance into knowledge, takes you from darkness into light, you can only begin to imagine what responsibility that puts upon, that what responsibility then falls upon your shoulder to pay that back. That's why, actually that's why, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is dearer to us than any other relationship. That's clear from hadith, right? We know the status of the mother. We know the status of the father. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that status for us. But at the same time, we know that the one relationship in life that over, that supersedes any other relationship except your relationship with Allah is your love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, we're not related to him in that regard, right? But actually, what did he do? He's our spiritual father. In the sense that he raised us from darkness to light. In the sense that he raised us from our ignorance into knowledge. In the sense that he raised us from being animals to being those people who now pursue Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's great name. So in that respect, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed a responsibility and who succeeds on the day of judgment? It's the one who adopts the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with that in mind. Why? He takes on the responsibility that was on the shoulder of the Prophet alayhi wa sallam. She takes on the responsibility that was placed upon the shoulder of the Prophet alayhi wa sallam, places it on their own back and then carries some of that weight to lighten his load. Right? Who takes in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or in this day and age his sunnah or in this day and age, his representatives, meaning those people who walk upon his path, and then and then form a relationship between either the sunnah or those people who follow his sunnah, which actually go hand in hand because that's how you inherit the sunnah, is by spending time in the company of those people who carry the sunnah. But irrespective, this is your greatest asset. And on the Day of Judgment, it will play a tremendous role for those people who take heed. So in the community, where you see scholars, where you see mashayikh, where you see people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised with knowledge, with understanding, with closeness, those are the people that you want to adopt. You want to forge a relationship with them. Of course, that doesn't negate the family relationship. The family relationship has its place. You have your responsibilities. They're defined by the sharia. There's a responsibility that the husband has to the wife, that the wife has to the husband, etc. We're not negating that. But what we're saying is, when a family takes in these types of people, that's when all of the blessings that happen to fall upon them also happen to come upon that family as well. So if if I can give you one piece of advice, it's to seek out the fakirs, the fuqara. Right? Seek those people out. Forge a relationship with them. Make them like your adopted part of your family. Make them part of your family, and you'll begin to see tremendous benefit, inshallah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to be among those who become fuqara and to be among those who constantly keep the company of the fuqara. And may he give us a tawfiq to adopt any of the fuqara that we happen to come in company with or in contact with. Wa akhiru ta'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.